Gaston is the greatest. The award ceremony for the four-cylinder category. Gaston Raillet, winner of the 1985 Paris-Dakar rally, and his colleagues are welcomed by cheering BMW team members. With the racing version of a BMW R80 GS, Raillet won the toughest race in the world, all with the dedicated support of the BMW service team. Paris Dakar 1985 was more dramatic and difficult than ever before. It took a lot of sweat to get to this point where the winner is smiling. And now for a more detailed report on the rally. The courtyard of the Palace of Versailles, just outside Paris, resembled an army camp. 543 vehicles of all classifications, motorcycles, passenger cars, all-wheel drive utility vehicles, and heavy tractor trucks had lined up to await the start of the 1985 Paris-Dakar rally. About 100,000 French turned out to take a close look at the vehicles involved in this motor-driven spectacle through the desert. There was a lot of interest in BMW's motorcycles, especially among the younger generation, since they knew that BMW motorcycles had won Paris-Dakar three times before. This year, the Paris-Dakar was laid out to be 8,700 miles in length, and compared with previous years, much more difficult. At the start, on New Year's Eve, thousands of spectators cheered on their favorites. Here's last year's winner, Gaston Raillet, with his BMW. Also as part of Team BMW, the seven-time German and four-time Enduro world champion, Eddie Howe from Sauerloch, taking part for the first time. As well, one of the most consistent riders of previous years, French policeman Raymond Loiseau. BMW felt well equipped with such a team, yet everything would turn out much differently than planned. Already on the first leg, Paris set, a careless truck driver has struck last year's winner Gaston Raillet, leaving his motorcycle damaged. So while all the other teams took a stroll through Algier, Team BMW had to go to work on repairing the collision damage to Raillet's bike. Throughout the first legs of the race, through Gardelia and Algolia, it became obvious that the organizers had chosen especially difficult routes. For the motorcycle riders, it was to become the toughest Paris-Dakar ever to be raced. At a gas station, Gaston Raillet passes on some advice to teammate Eddie Howe. He himself, due to his accident on the first leg of the race, is considered hopeless at number 30. And the unlucky streak wasn't coming to an end anytime soon. Raymond Loiseau hit a rock covered by sand, crashed, and was eliminated. The starting field in the wee hours of the morning. Gaston Raillet gets dressed and ready. He knows he cannot stop for a second if he wants to make up time and move ahead in the rankings. Raillet, only five foot four inches tall, is nicknamed Tom Thumb and has to literally mount the BMW R80 GS. However, he handles the bike brilliantly. Start of the next leg and back into the endless desert. The raceway seems blocked off at this point, but is it an official? Better to keep on going straight. The next rider heeds the detour and goes around. What was the right thing to do? Out here, there's only gut instinct to rely on, as well as experience and the ability to read a compass. Raillet on his BMW had a difficult passage. He is totally focused. He has to make up time. And what might be perceived as child's play is, in fact, riding expertise at its best. Especially in sand, the 70 horsepower of this race version R80 GS requires an experienced rider. And here is Eddie Howe with his BMW, who, with Loiseau eliminated and Raillet far behind, is all by himself in the top ranks. That was nerve-wracking. 
The true heroes of this leg of the Paris-Dakar rally were indeed the motorcycle riders. The kind of difficulties and pressures they had to overcome were at the limit of what could humanly be endured and sometimes beyond. The result of the continuous strain on the riders was an increasing number of accidents and falls that did not all end as fortunately as this one did. The rider is okay. A quick glance at the bike and off he goes. Like a magnet, the 8,700-mile-long Paris-Dakar desert adventure annually attracts drivers from all over Europe. The blend of sports and adventure is hard to resist, but some just don't have the level of endurance and riding expertise required. The camps are usually set up near small airfields. This was the only way to join up with the riders each night. We waited for hours in Taman Rasse for the arrival of Eddie Howe and Gaston Rayet. Could bad luck have struck again? No Eddie Howe in sight. But Raye arrives at this lake's destination with a delay of two hours. Something happened, Gaston? But, uh, yeah, that's right. Today was a good day. The bike was great. Everything was great. And then, a flat tire. Initial disappointment is immediately replaced by hope coming from this diminutive rider with a big heart. Yeah, but I think on Morgan. I think tomorrow we are going to have a very good day. Last year I was first on that very day, and I was first in the race. So I think tomorrow it's going to be a very, very good leg for us, for BMW. Arriving late at the destination translates into overnight work for the service team. Filters have to be cleaned, and spark plugs, oil, and dented rims have to be changed. Everything is checked carefully, with nothing left to chance. And finally, in the middle of the night, the lost Eddie Howe shows up. He fell, yet made it to this lake's destination with a broken motorcycle and a broken wrist. So hope dwindles further for Team BMW. With only one motorcycle and Raye left in the race, whose bad luck at the beginning threw him way back in the rankings. Lake Taman Rasse Ifurunan. Over 340 miles of the worst desert dunes and gravel covered alpine passages. This is the leg of the race that Gaston Raillet chooses to begin his unbelievable pursuit to catch up to the front of the pack. He wants to catch up to the leading Italian Pico on Yamaha and the two time Paris Dakar champion, Hubert Oriol, who took to the start on a two cylinder Kagiva. Oriol, who came in second on his BMW in 1984, would not be content with second place this time. Supported by his water carriers, some of whom were actually from different teams, he rode very fast, very consistently. He handled street bumps easily. Niveau on Honda is not doing nearly as well here. And then there's Gaston Raillet on BMW. Depending on no one but himself alone, he puts down an incredible speed. He passes one competitor after another and places himself in the leading group. Ifuruan, Raye is the first one to make it past the finish line. 
he won the leg of the race and improved his ranking. He is now number four, but still lagging one hour behind. The waiting journalists swarm the Belgian rider, and he has to answer many questions about his pursuit to catch up. Ifa Rouen, a small green oasis at the foot of the mountains, is on the very edge of the desert. It resembles a fort inside, in which the settlers have built their huts. Humans and cattle live together in close proximity, and most important, you can find water here. Bathroom, desert style. There are no hotels in the desert, and everyone is grateful to find water in the first place. For days, there was none. Even that is a part of the adventure. Gas station, desert style. From the barrel via a rubber tube into the canister, at least it's possible to fill up somewhat accurately. The next morning, it's time to tackle the marathon leg of 745 miles through the Teneri Desert. It's as large as the former West Germany. Here, Gaston Royer takes off before Hubert Oriel, who has slipped in the rankings, but now tries to play catch-up himself. The Teneri Desert can only be mastered with a compass. Out here, getting lost means running out of gas and waiting for hours or days for the rescue helicopter to find you. One of the feared sandstorms came up, increasing the danger of getting lost. If you did not know how to read a compass at this point, then you would not have made this stage of the race, since the racetracks were covered within minutes and became simply unrecognizable. The rescue helicopters were flying out on a continuous basis, picking up racers who got lost in the desert. Alone and without teammates, but with an undeniable fighting spirit, Gaston Raillet lays down an unbelievable speed through the Teneri Desert, to the extent that many of his competitors cannot keep up. When he re-emerges out of the frying pan, he may have earned the title King of the Desert, but he still has one competitor with a lead of 50 minutes in front of him. The difficulty of the routes this year becomes evident when, at this point, the passenger car category starts to experience its heaviest losses. The last one, the usually charging Opel Manta, had to give up two-thirds into the leg. After the marathon leg through the desert, everyone has earned the day off in Agadez. The motorcycle is running fine, but needs the sand cleaned out. Oil and air filter are changed, new tires are mounted. For the first time after some 4,300 miles, Gaston Raillet gets to relax for a day, studying the road book for the next legs of the rally. He knows there is no help for him out there, and that even the slightest chance of his getting lost could lead to elimination. The previous year's number two has been held up by technical defects, which does not mean a lot at the halfway mark of this leg. Plus, he still has his water carriers at his disposal. <laughs> And how is Gaston Raillet feeling? 
For me, the race through the Teneri Desert was very good. I did not have that many problems after the start. We had some problems. We were unlucky. At this moment, we have a good position coming out of the Teneri race. And I think we have a good chance to get an even better position in the next leg. Was the Teneri Desert difficult for you? Was it a strain on your endurance? Yes, it was difficult, since it is a longer race leg. Yesterday we had 745 miles, and it is tough through the sand, a tough race. Especially after we've done some 3,100 miles, and this day was very, very difficult. Where does this man get the strength, all alone, and depending on himself only, to fight like this? Throughout the next two legs, via Gao to Tombacto, Gaston Rarier on his BMW managed to get even closer to the man in the lead, Pico. However, the competition was not sleeping either, with the teams of Honda and Yamaha breathing down Rarier's neck. Olivier on his Yamaha emerged especially strong. And surprisingly, making his way to the front again is Hubert Oriol on his Kagiva. Only the most optimistic of journalists has bet on Raye to win again. But he said, we will know the result at the finish line, and that's still far away. <laughs> the drivers barely got to take in the adventurous attractions of Tombacto, formerly known as Timbuktu. The race pushes the drivers to the limits of their endurance. The equipment slowly breaks down. The number of dropouts increases. By this point, the initial lineup has shrunk to a third. Then Mauritania had its own set of surprises in store. Next morning, the new starting lineup. Among the first, Hubert Oriol, who is just waiting for his chance. Gaston Raillet is fully aware of that, knowing that he has to remain on the lookout. The Mauritanian Desert. Here, the organizers came up with a very special treat. They sent the participants into the areas that had never seen vehicles before, let alone motorcycles. At first, there's a discernible racetrack, but it soon disappears. Gaston Raillet steers the BMW R80 GS at an unbelievable speed, and it runs reliably like clockwork. Very few drivers could keep up this pace, trying to hold their position and hoping for dropouts within the top ranks. And then it happened. Gaston Raillet got lost arriving with a delay of two hours at the lake's destination. Big disappointment among the team members, but then, like a blessing, the news that the man in the lead, Pico, had gotten lost as well, also arriving with a delay of two hours. The previous distance between the two was still intact. But then another scare. Oriol has gained on Raye, and now there are only 16 minutes between them. The last legs of the race, from Mauritania to Senegal, and then on to the finish line in Dakar. There were some battles for the mid-range rankings. Then the surprise. Pico, in the lead, dropped out due to engine failure. Raye, with his BMW, was now in the lead. But Dakar had not been reached quite yet. Olivier set himself apart from the bulk of Yamaha racers, trying to catch up to the leading Raillet. <laughs> 
Even Hubert Oriol on his Kagiva was determined to gain on Gaston Royer during the final stretch of the race. But it was not enough. An engine defect threw him back some five hours. With the cheering of several thousands on the beach in Dakar and a lead of over 50 minutes, the king of the desert, Gaston Raye, races towards the finish line. Olivier on Yamaha comes second. It was the second time that the 34-year-old Belgian Royer won the Paris Dakar Rally on a BMW. And it was the fourth win of this gigantic race for BMW, with Gaston Royer exclaiming at the finish line, this was the toughest race of my life, but I am happy. <laughs> 